quarter of uh, 2022. My name is Mihai Grigore. Uh, I'm an analyst with uh, Masari. And today I'm joined by my uh, co-host and colleague at Masari, Stephanie Dunbar. Uh, hi, Stephanie. Thanks for joining. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be here with you. Um, co-authored this piece with Mihai, and we're happy to be here uh, speaking with Doug Cantix from LifePeer, uh, the founder um, and CEO of LifePeer, Inc. Um, Doug, if you want to give a little intro about yourself as well. Sure thing. Yeah, thanks for hosting. Masari, Stephanie, uh, Mihai, uh, excited to be here. I'm Doug Cantix, founder at LivePeer, a video infrastructure protocol that's been running live in the Ethereum ecosystem for four years. Uh, excited to talk to you guys and dive in. So for those of you in the audience who uh, are not accustomed with uh, uh, Messari and uh, uh, with our quarterly reports, so uh, at Messari we uh, do data and research aggregation for uh, open decentralized uh, protocols and LifePeer is uh, one of them. And uh, in front of us, we, we have a sample of uh, the recent quarterly report that Stephanie and myself have co-authored on uh, the state of life peer, uh, Q1 2022. And uh, in a nutshell uh, here, what we do is uh, we aggregate data from uh, different sources. Uh, so for this specific case of life peer, we aggregated data from uh, Dune Analytics and also from the graph. And this whole effort is done uh, together with uh, other teams in, in, in Messari. So uh, we have here fantastic help uh, from uh, our data engineers and data scientists putting together and aggregating uh, all the data, all the necessary data uh, to be able to, to put together uh, yeah, all the quarterly metrics that we uh, have been tracked for, for LifePeer. So perhaps in a couple of words, uh, what we have been looking at uh, was uh, at the usage of, uh, of LifePeer uh, in terms of minutes transcoded, uh, in terms of uh, also demand for, for, the, whole, uh, for the whole service, um, how much actually uh, revenue has been generated, uh, both on the supply side, also on the demand side. And then we went uh, uh, through tokenomics uh, and further on through uh, yeah, roadmap and uh, notable events for, for, for the quarter. Um, yeah, so uh, before we actually uh, get into um, looking at the numbers, uh, we would first like to, to start with a short intro uh, on what is LifePeer um, so that uh, we get a bit of a grasp for, for everybody in the audience uh, what is the problem that LifePeer is trying to solve? And you can see here on, on the left-hand side under input, we do uh, have um, represented the demand part uh, for, for LifePeer, which is various applications and developers uh, who need uh, transcoding services. Um, video transcoding is the process of, pro of uh, um, transforming uh, videos into uh, a format that, uh, for instance, can be um, watched on uh, our mobile mobile phones, and this is often used in uh, live streams, for 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 instance. Um, so yeah, from from the demand side, we come to the to the middle, uh, to the live peer network, uh, which is uh, formed by um, yeah three uh, main um, stakeholders. So they are like the the main node operators. Uh, big in charge uh, for the for the transcoding. Uh, then we do have the transcoders actually doing the work, and then we do have the delegators. So all of them together deliver the transcoded videos that are being actually uh, output and uh, delivered to the users via different uh, different services. Um, so perhaps um, here to, to to start it off, Doug. Uh, we would be interested in, in your take uh, on why is transcoding so relevant for uh, the web services nowadays? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, that overview. You know, backing up to LivePeer's mission, it's actually to build the world's open video infrastructure and open video software. Um, video is 80% of the traffic on the internet. It's the way that we, you know, increasingly communicate, get our entertainment, get our education, learn. Uh, 
and participate in the world economy. So it's and it's growing at a tremendous pace. And that puts a tremendous burden on the internet infrastructure to actually deliver all of this video around the world. And we saw that during the pandemic when you know, the European Union actually asked Netflix to reduce the quality of their streaming because it was taking too much bandwidth and too much, putting too much strain on the infrastructure. Um, and you saw Zoom kind of buckle under the growing demand and, and these sorts of things. So, you know, uh, video is uh, very important, but it's very uh, burdensome on infrastructure. Therefore, it's very expensive. It's very hard to scale. And it's actually kind of prohibitive for developers that are trying to compete with, you know, the big cloud owned platforms like um, Google owns YouTube and Amazon owns Twitch. If developers are trying to create new innovative video experiences, um, they typically can't afford to scale the infrastructure to, to um, create compelling applications. And so uh, what LivePeer does is it actually lets all of this idle compute capacity and bandwidth around the world in data centers that node operators happen to have um, come together to form a video infrastructure network that's an alternative to Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud. Um, it's an independent network. It's an open marketplace where anyone with compute capacity can, can put it on. And um, you know, the LivePeer software provides many different elements of, of the video infrastructure from you know, ingest to origin services to a player to um, everything developers need. But what the LivePeer network does, this network of you know, 100 node operators and thousands of transcoders and tens of thousands of GPU devices out there, um, it provides all the compute that's necessary to make sure that we can actually deliver video reliably around the world. And that compute um, takes the form of something called transcoding, you mentioned. That's when uh, you know an HD video in 1080p comes into the network. You need to convert it into you know, lower resolution, 720p, 480p, 360p, um, so that it can be watched on phones and smart TVs and low, low bandwidth connections without buffering and without disruption. Um, and all this stuff happens behind the scenes. Typically, as a user, you don't care about it or know about it. All you know is that when you press play, that video starts streaming to you and it doesn't buffer and, and cut out and reduce the quality. And that's what our, our great network of node operators are um, you know, powering at a, a fraction of the cost of what you see in other um, kind of SaaS enterprise live, um, live streaming services that typically charge up to you know, $3 an hour per live stream of video that's coming in. Um, the Live Peer Network does it for about a, a tenth of the price and, and even less um, in some cases. Thanks for that overview, Doug. Um, and yeah, there's just clearly a huge demand um, for video transcoding services, um, you know, a huge need across, you know, all parts of the internet. Um, I was just curious to hear, um, because it's such a large problem, are there other, you know, decentralized video transcoding um, services or, you know, networks that are also trying to tackle this problem? Um, in, I, I know that, you know, we have the Amazon and the, the Googles, of, or the Amazon and the um, other centralized, you know, players of the world, but if there's other, you know, decentralized ones as well that are trying to go forward with this mission. I think when you look across the whole decentralized tech stack, uh, stack what makes LivePeer pretty unique is we focus exclusively on uh, video infrastructure, letting other developers have these tools accessible to build the applications they want. Um, of course, there's other great projects that um, kind of circle around this space and do similar things. The Theta Network has their own video application and focuses on kind of content delivery. Transcoding is kind of a, a little less considered piece of that. Um, you see other compute type protocols, like there's a great one called Render Protocol, which doesn't focus on video transcoding, but kind of has similar mechanisms for applying compute to 3D rendering um, and these sorts of things. So. Um, you know, in, in the Web3 world, we're kind of all in this together in a, a composable and rising tide lifts all boats ways and excited to see how developers put these things together. So in terms of uh, uh, developers and uh, in terms of applications, actually, uh, yeah, using using LivePeer, um, Stephanie and myself have been aggregating uh, numbers on, on the usage and uh, uh, here uh, perhaps the most uh, yeah, important metric to, to actually track is the number of uh, minutes transcoded. And uh, here we can, we can see that uh, over uh, the last uh, six previous quarters, we uh, had uh, an all-time high 
uh, including for, for this quarter, which is a 12% increase versus uh, the previous uh, uh, yeah, quarter, the Q4 2021. And uh, um, here the um, question for you, Doug, is uh, where does this demand comes mostly from? Great, yeah, excited to see the uh, the upward trend, of course. It's always good to kind of surpass the, the previous quarter. Um, I don't know if you're seeing the chart be a little cut off. I'm seeing it. I think um, the number for Q1 is, is was it 31 or 33 million it's minutes or so, but- 33 indeed. Yep, great. So um, what this means, you know, 33 million minutes of video over the quarter, it means that at any given moment, um, there's a couple hundred live streams of video flowing through the platform that are being transcoded. And this doesn't mean there's a couple hundred viewers on one stream. It means there's you know, a couple hundred unique different streams of video um, coming from the, all the live peer users, all the applications that are built on live peer, um, you know, at any given moment that are being processed by, by the nodes. So who are these users? Um, I think there's, there's kind of two different worlds to look at. One world is maybe traditional web two streaming applications. Um, these are things that look like Twitch, but are maybe built for specific communities. Um, you know, there's an app called Play DJ, which is a DJ streaming platform. There's an app built for artists called Picardo, which is an artist streaming platform. There's a social commerce platform called Kurkuma. There's uh, radio stations that stream 24 seven, like the lot radio, um, all leveraging live peer for its cost effectiveness and to add transcoding to their, their stack. Um, what, you know, many of these not all have in common is their user generated content apps. Mm -hmm. Again, things like Twitch where users are the ones that are allowed to kind of for free go live and create content. Um, and that means that uh, kind of a scalable infrastructure is really important because you might have hundreds of users streaming at once. Um, you'd have to spin up a lot of servers and operate them if you're operating them yourselves, whereas if you outsource that to live peer, it's valuable. Um, and cost matters, especially if you're letting your users go live for free. You, know, you can't be paying $3 an hour for each one of those users on their behalf. Um, you wouldn't scale, you'd bankrupt yourself. And so um, kind of in the traditional world, live peer delivers that impact. And that's great because there's a lot of demand there today. It feeds dollars and fees into our platform for the node operators um, help show the viability of the network and improve the product. And then kind of the second camp, I mean, one we're really building for and excited about is a uh, more web three centric creative uh, set of users. So these are people that are really asking the question, hey, what's unique about web three and crypto that's possible now that, that wasn't possible in the other world? Um, and how do we create new experiences around that? And you see people building, um, you know, decentralized social applications that give users ownership in the platforms and, um, you know, have community based content moderation and governance policies, um, things that try and correct a lot of the challenges and frustrations that creators have with YouTube, where they kind of don't have control over their monetization and they don't have any say or visibility into uh, whether they're going to be featured or not featured or deplatformed. Um, right, same kind of, you know, solving the problems you see with platforms like Twitch and Twitter um, that, you know, can be corrected through kind of community owned governance and uh, community ownership that you see in, in Web3, right? Um, you see people experimenting with other primitives, like how do NFTs combine with video? Um, how do you do token gating access to, to content instead of, you know, traditional proprietary DRM? type access. And so, you know, we're really excited about this world. This quarter was actually a big one where we saw a lot of growth in that from hackathons. Um, I think we're going to see breakout apps there that dwarf these numbers um, in the coming coming year. Um, but, you know, today, one of the side effects is that world is actually much smaller in terms of minutes contributed um, here because they're all experiments. They're all hacks. The user bases are small, but uh, really excited to kind of see some breakout mainstream successes there that, that cross over and have them be powered by live peer. Super interesting. Um, yeah, you've been going to you know tons of hackathons and supporting lots of projects being built on the network this quarter. I think it was 72 um, this past quarter alone, if I recall correctly. Um, and 
Yeah, I'm just thinking, like you mentioned, it's a smaller part of demand right now as those kind of grow. And if I understand correctly, Live Peer Inc. is also helping uh, with some of the traditional Web2 applications to, you know, join the network and get the video transcoding services. And at what point do you think that perhaps some of these newer projects or Web3 oriented projects will kind of uh, outgrow in demand with some of the uh, other ones you got going on right now that take a significant chunk? We're ready for social summer. I think that's the, uh, the hashtag going around. I think um, it's been really exciting. We've been working on Live Peer for um, over five years now. And in the early days, there was very few developers that were actually thinking at the application layer that were actually creating great consumer experiences because a lot of the infrastructure and tooling like wasn't quite ready yet. Um, and there was so much opportunity to still build out the primitives, the infrastructure, the financial primitives, the development platforms, right? Now in the last year, kind of as catalyzed by the acceleration of gaming adopting blockchain and NFTs being this kind of breakthrough opportunities for creators to better connect with, monetize their, their art, their creations, their content. Uh, now you're seeing this interesting mainstream crossover and a lot of the infrastructure platforms are in place. So. You know, live peer can clearly power live streaming. Um, you know, our weave and IPFS slash Filecoin can provide reliable um, kind of storage and application serving. The graph is a great indexing platform. Um, there's, there's kind of all of these primitives are in place where developers can create scalable um, kind of social applications, media applications. And, you know, we're seeing things like um, Kind of the DSO network launch and Lens protocol um, come to their mainnet very soon, which are social protocols that are actually catalyzing a lot of developer attention on these mainstream applications. So, you know, the, the social summer concept is something that um, has been thrown around. But I, you know, I think if you just look at the next three to six months, I think you'll see these these viable proof of concept social apps actually take the next step, do something innovative that changes the game a little bit, and and you know attract a million users and that'll serve as inspiration for a whole bunch of development that can only you know grow grow from there eventually we'll see a you know a TikTok scale application that leverages you know crypto assets and tokens and nfts because why wouldn't you that creates such a better um kind of experience for the creators themselves that uh you know they should flock to it so uh, yeah, with the advent of the social summer, as you as you call it, uh, you essentially say that the market is going to continue to to grow. And uh, looking at the numbers uh, um, for the previous quarters and looking at this tremendous growth, uh, I'm wondering whether the growth comes actually from a growing market or from starting from a very very small base. Uh, you know, starting from very close to zero and then increasing over quarter over quarter what do you think is uh, is the perspective here in the um kind of in that web two-ish world i think you'll see kind of a, a steady um more predictable growth motion just through kind of increasing adoption of the the software and those apps themselves growing but i think in the the Web3 world, which I said is is really what we're building for. It's really where Live Peer has the opportunity to be the the leader in a new and growing market, as opposed to just a competitor in a, a pretty crowded, mature market. You know, video has been around for 70 plus plus years, and there's many service providers there. In the Web3 world, we're really well positioned to be the video infrastructure and ensuring you know 72 hacks last quarter were built on us. You know, many more hopefully this quarter. Uh, you know, th those couple breakout applications that cross over, I think we'll, you'll see step function growth where, um, you know, you'll see single applications delivering a higher order of magnitude than even this, this total streaming volume, but it's, it's hard to predict exactly when that happens. Um, but you'll, you know, once that happens, you'll see kind of a step function growth from there. So hard to make a minutes, um, prediction. And in fact, you may even see due to like, leaning into Web3 world and kind of a focus on this opportunity, which has lower volume today, you may even see, you know, less growth in the next quarter than previously. But, you know, we're, we're true believers building for the future and believe that those breakout um, Web3 applications will really be the thing that catalyze, um, yeah, not, not just minutes to the live peer network, but actually pretty impactful changes <laughs> to, you know, the, the world and the way that people consume their social media and their media. 
Yeah, that uh, makes total sense. So we're we're looking forward to see demand continue to uh, to grow over the next quarters as well, and uh, perhaps uh, shifting gears towards uh, supply. Um, here in in this chart, we see um, that LifePeer offers uh, staking rewards, and uh, on the x-axis we we see. Uh, pretty much the timeline since LifePeer was uh, was started uh, roughly uh, four years ago. And then on the y-axis, uh, we have been plotting uh, um, pretty much the uh, percentage of uh, uh, um, stake. Um, and uh, we can uh, uh, we can pretty much see, and, and unfortunately, this is not shown uh, correctly. Uh, let me try to, to see whether, uh, yeah, it is, now yeah. it is being shown correctly. Um, so on, on the y-axis, we have uh, the percentage of uh, life peer token uh, being being staked, and we can see that uh, the percentage uh, started from from zero in uh, uh, May 2018, and then increased, yeah, gradually um, uh, surpassing a, a threshold of 50 percent and going towards uh, 70 percent in the summer of uh, 2020. And then since then we see like a reduction in the percentage and everything converts towards uh, the threshold of 50 percent uh, which have been uh, discussing in the uh, in the report it's the so-called equilibrium threshold and then since then we see that uh, pretty much the percentage uh, stays roughly at, uh, at at that level and uh, uh, perhaps um, yeah it is uh, worthwhile to explain a bit uh, how, how this actually works. So whenever the percentage goes above uh, 50%, there is a tiny reduction in the, uh, in the inflation, in the, in the staking rewards uh, that brings actually that percentage slowly back. And then whenever the percentage is below 50%, uh, there is a slight increase uh, in, in, in the supply. And uh, um, here, uh, what we would like you to, uh, to tell us is, how did you come up with the percentage of uh, yeah, 50? Why hasn't it been 60 or 70%? Uh, did you have like any rule in, in mind when, you, when you've set this one? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So what we... Um... Now, yeah, transport yourself back to the crypto world and crypto economic thinking, you know, five and a half years ago, um, before there was a ton of examples and DeFi protocols and yield, gener yield farming and, you know, studies of incentives and whatnot. And we actually, um, so many networks were beginning to launch or publish white papers and they were creating a issuance schedule, Bitcoin being the initial example that said, well, there's 21 million Bitcoin all time, and you know exactly what the, the issuance or release schedule of those Bitcoin are going to be um, in each block and based on happenings. And then you saw you know, other protocols come along and create curves and say, okay, there's going to be an inflation curve, and we're going to have this much release for the first couple of years and this much release for the second. And they kind of innovated on that a little bit. And we, um, you know, we did something kind of innovative. We said, well, really what we want to be doing is we want to be incentivizing people to participate in this network and to provide video encoding capacity and to be staking their tokens to do quality assurance and route work on this network and um, we always want that incentive to be there regardless of um, kind of how much the network has been used or, or matured there's always going to be a, a balance between how many fees there are to earn versus how much inflation inflationary live peer token needs to be earned by these node operators to incent these things. If fees are really high, maybe you need less inflation. If fees are really low, maybe you need a lot of inflation. And it's impossible to sit here and predict what that curve should look like for the next hundred years. Instead, what we should do is we should just target something that self-corrects to try and ensure there's always about half of the tokens participating and staked on the network. And you ask the question, why 50? Why not 60? Why not 70? I'll be honest, like the 50% is somewhat arbitrary. It's not, it, it, it's also acknowledged like the community through governance could adjust that if they learn over time that it should be something else that's being targeted. But what are the reasons? Okay, you want a bunch of tokens staked and participating and that's locked up for a period of time. So it's long-term committed. 
you also want some token to be liquid so that it allows people to enter and exit the system to cover their cost to acquire token to begin participating in my peer and you want to leave some room for kind of experimental alternative uses of the token like if people want to create additional protocols on top of live peer around governance or um, DAOs or signaling or whatever the case may be and so the 50 percent number felt uh, you know loosely correct like a good starting point but i'd say it's worked out um you know pretty well and i wouldn't say there's been some major learning that it you know it should be adjusted to be higher or lower the, the more interesting thing is um really like when you look at this chart it's not surprising that um you know it took a while to hit 50 percent because of the way the token was released and people began to participate and learn about it over the first couple of years um, and during that you know year and a half the inflation rate rose up every day. So the incentives to participate in stake were very high. And in fact, I think it was nearly a 100% annual kind of yield or rate of return on staking. So you double your token by staking it on the network over the course of a year. Um, big incentive to participate in stake, right? And so you saw the participation rise up to 70%. And then, you know, as soon as you pass that, that threshold in you know, May or June of, of 2019, well, the inflation rate started to tick back down and it actually got kind of close to zero. And as you got, you know, it was, I forget what it was, two, three, 4% annual return. And people found, oh, there's better opportunities for me to, you know, get better returns um, in the DeFi ecosystem, for example. Let me unstake and, and, you know, maybe leave to go chase those. But as they did that, you know, really, if you look at the past year or so, we found this, this equilibrium around 50% participation and you've seen, the inflation rate go up for a couple of days and down for a couple of days and up for a couple of days and down for a couple of days. And it's really settled, um, you know, it's been going up for a little while um, and it's settled around this, you know, eight and a half percent kind of inflation for the entire network. But because that only goes to the, the 50 percent or so that are staked and participating, you know, I think I did the calculation today. It's about an 18 percent kind of yield on your, your LPT if you stake. Um, which I think is, you know, pretty appealing and, and competitive has led a lot of people to get involved, to stake, to stay long term committed, participate in the network. Um, and you know, maybe maybe we found that equilibrium for the current, you know, volume of fees that are earned by by node operators. I think as that you know, increases by many orders of magnitude, maybe the inflation will come down a little bit as people chase that. But um, for now, it seems healthy. Thanks, Doug. Um, and you see on that chart as well, if you head over to, you know, mid-February 2022, um, the, you know, the sharp drop. Um, so I guess shifting gears a little bit, um, if you want to talk about, you know, what caused that sharp drop, um, you know, the, the migration to Arbitrum. Um, and yeah, like what, what that kind of meant, you know, overall for the community, um, the, the whole transition period. Yeah, so one of the most painful and challenging things that we've dealt with in my peer is, um, congestion on the Ethereum network. You know, we deployed on the Ethereum network four years ago, gas fees, for those who are familiar with gas, were about one G-way, um, which is a, you know, an order of magnitude of 100 to 200 times lower than they are today. And so the network actually became very expensive for our node operators and our token holding delegators to, to stake and participate. In fact, only those that had a lot of stake could kind of profitably do the protocol transactions every day to generate new live peer token. And so, you know, for the last year, it's become a huge priority to, to solve this. And we made some protocol updates to give relief, but really the big um, win was to migrate a lot of the kind of in protocol actions off of main Ethereum onto an Ethereum secured layer two called Arbitrum. And in uh, January, we kind of completed that migration um, you know, the community did a great job through the governance and the testing and the test nets and whatnot to get ready for this. We completed that migration and actually were able to um, pretty quickly have most of the node operators um, migrate over to Arbitrum um, and bring all of the stake that was staked towards them kind of along along with them. Um, you know, it took a couple of days to get everyone over and that's why you see kind of a quick drop and then a, a recovery. Um, but, you know, almost all of the LPT has migrated over to Arbitrum at this point and is actively participating in the network. And the good news is it actually reduced 
the fees for node operators and, and token holding delegators by something like 97%. Um, so you used to kind of only be able to run a node and earn LPT every day if you were going to be making more than a couple hundred dollars worth of LPT and rewards for doing that. That required a lot of stake and doing a lot of work on the network. Whereas now, um, as long as you're um, kind of able to earn more than a couple dollars a day, you can you can profitably participate in the network. Um, and that's a, a huge unlock that helps kind of the health of the supply side. That's great. So that must have been, you know, like a significant chunk of node operators are now able to reach profitability given those fees. Would you say that it's gone from like, let's say 20% to, you know, 100, something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have the number right in front of me um, for that. So I'm going to ballpark it, but um, it, it had gotten so bad and kind of the tail end of the Ethereum era there that there was something like, you know, only 17 node operators or 12 node operators or something that could like every day consistently call reward. Now the others could still compete to earn the ETH fees and were, you know, fighting to, to profitably transcode video and, and we're doing okay that way, but they weren't able to become owners in the live peer network. They weren't able to earn the live peer token every day as was designed. Um, and then with, you know, migration to Arbitrum, I know immediately it was, it was something like 60 plus of the node operators um, had the opportunity to be be profitable. And I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, there, there's a set of 100. I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of them can participate profitably on uh, Arbitrum if they're there and uh, actually yeah. running the infrastructure and are competing to transcode video um, and not just kind of an idle node. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, perhaps uh, looking at the sharp uh, rebound in the percentage of uh, uh, LPT staked. So after February 14th, we, we we see that rebound, you know, back to 48 and very very close to 50 percent. Uh, and we were wondering whether that went organically or whether there was uh, any intervention needed from from the community side. Uh, how did that uh, go? Um, I. Intervention is actually an interesting word because it, I don't know, it implies kind of, you know, proactively taking a forceful stance in order to uh, intervene and will something to happen. Um, I, I wouldn't say that there was anything that needed to be like immediately reacted to that wasn't expected. I would say there is, you know, proactive communication and, uh, you know, we've had, it, we have so many community calls, blog posts, you know, our discord channel our, our node operator community we call them orchestrators the orchestrator community is incredible and like even far more active than the core team in terms of communications and sharing information and so um you know i don't think there was an intervention but i think it was pretty clear to everyone that hey those rewards that you have been earning like if you want to keep earning them you need to do this transaction to migrate to ethereum and by the way as long as you install the latest node software and upgrade it um you know other than doing kind of one manual transaction that should be pretty seamless and, and shouldn't affect your uh your operations too much i know they had um the community did a great job and actually had a little bit of trouble running on arbitrum because running arbitrum nodes was m way more difficult than running ethereum nodes for some reason or the hosting providers like infura and alchemy were expensive or rate limited or um kind of tough for an independent uh, operator to access profitably so the community actually like came together and solved this problem and jointly ran a node and uh, formed a little coordination around it. Even though they're competing with one another for fees, they're actually more of a tight knit community <laughs> working to kind of make this network um, usable. So that was was really inspiring to see. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And also, this is a, a testimonial that, uh, uh, yeah, the staking uh, uh, reward uh, uh, mechanism actually works and uh, works on its own and uh, this is a beautiful exemplification of uh, uh, of that um, perhaps to 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 show very very quickly what happened in terms of uh, uh, yeah token inflation um, we were able to see that inflation in march so uh, roughly let's say two weeks after the migration uh, increased from 0 0.65 percent to 0. 8%. Uh, so this was like from, from those small gradual increases in, in, in order to bring uh, the percentage of uh, state 
um, live peer token yeah back from 32 percent to 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 50 percent and uh, uh, pretty much this is uh, this is what we were able to to measure in terms of uh, 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 increase in, uh, in in inflation, and uh, uh, yeah, we were we were wondering that uh, indeed uh, the the mechanism, the reward mechanism, uh, seemed to have worked uh, uh, flawlessly for for the for the whole migration. Are there any other qualitative insights that uh, you you experienced during the migration that maybe uh, we we haven't seen uh, in the numbers so far? Yeah, one thing, um, you know, th this is outside of the numbers uh, <clears throat> and, and kind of the, the stake mechanics, but um, one thing that you do see is uh, these layer twos like Arbitrum and Optimism and Polygon actually provide like tremendous benefits um, to the, the users that are actively participating in the protocols and create opportunities for them to participate profitably, become owners in them at, at low cost, just like in the early days of of Ethereum. Um, one thing I would highlight is that there's still a ways to go before each of these ecosystems actually has the full composability and functionality and feature set that layer one Ethereum has. So for example, um, you know, to get your tokens out of Arbitrum back to Ethereum, there's a seven day waiting period um, for the bridge, which is um, just based on a security mechanism of this, this layer two. And why do people need to go back? Well, there's a lot of like liquidity through DeFi for tokens on, on layer one Ethereum. And there's you know, protocols where that liquidity can exist on layer two, but maybe it's not there yet. Or you know, exchanges allow you to deposit and withdraw tokens from layer one on Ethereum, but haven't yet added support for kind of layer two deposits and with withdrawals. So um, you know, th these these layer twos are great for kind of participating profitably and being committed to the protocols. Um, and I think they'll become even more, you know, usable and full featured as uh, the ecosystems around them get supported. Yeah, so um, speaking of all the, uh, you know, operational uh, matters when, when migrating from, from Ethereum to, to Arbitrum, uh, yeah, what, we, what we've done uh, in, in this chart is uh, we took all the rounds uh, in, in Q1, so starting January 1st to March 31st. And we had in total like 100 such rounds and it, it was like 50 on, on Ethereum and then 50 on, on Arbitrum. So you see on the X axis actually the number of, uh, of, of the rounds. And uh, uh, on the Y axis, uh, we uh, have been plotted the, the moved stake. Um, this is actually a logarithmic chart because uh, we weren't able to actually visualize, you know, like the, the big difference uh, from before versus versus after. So uh, we, we had to apply logarithm to, uh, to the values. And uh, um, pretty much we, we can see that, uh, yeah, the amount of moved stakes, so the, the amount of activity increased a lot after the, the migration. And uh, uh, what we have been um, uh, marking, highlighting on the right-hand side was the so-called uh, moving rush. Um, so uh, essentially um, in the second half of February, so between February 15th and uh, March, uh, March 1st, uh, there was a sort of uh, yeah, moving rush. And uh, um, uh, pretty much we've been, we've been trying to see whether afterwards things will settle down and if they settle down yeah at what rate would uh, would, would that be so what we what we did is we we've tried to calculate yeah the moved stake that actually happened in in march and we wanted to compare it with what happened before and the best comparison we were able to find is to compare march actually with january you know the full months and uh, the percentage that we that we found uh, so uh, when comparing March to, to January uh, was uh, actually 60 times. Uh, so there was like 60 times more uh, yeah, uh, moved stake in, in March, like post arbitral migration uh, than, than actually before, uh, bef before that. And uh, we were wondering whether uh, employing such a, such a methodology is uh, accurate, first of all. So um, we've been trying to, to, to see whether if we compute it for you know one and a half months, you know since February fifteenth to 
uh, April 1st, we might uh, actually compare apples and bananas. So we, we didn't want to do that. Um, if you were to actually compare pro uh, like before versus after, uh, would that be other methodology that you, you would employ here? Good question. I mean, first of all, I just want to say this is so cool that uh, Masari was able to create not only like just like a quarterly report, just like a company would do where they have to provide the all, all their own data, but like Masari was able to independently create this report and draw these insights totally from like open data accessible on a blockchain to anyone. Um, it's just like a really powerful testament to kind of blockchains, open data sets, Web3. Um, and you're able to come up with like ins insights like this, right? I think the um, I think the methodology is sound. I'm not surprised by this dramatic increase because back on Ethereum, yeah, there was incentives for you to move your stake around, move it from one node to another to potentially chase yield. Except that those incentives were obliterated, especially for kind of smaller stakers, by the high fees that you have to pay um, in order to do the transactions. So. Great, you can earn a couple more live peer token over the course of a month or two if you take the staking action, except if it's gonna cost you, you know, $200 in Ethereum to do a couple transactions, it, it you know, doesn't make financial sense. Whereas as soon as you um, kind of enter Arbitrum in this low cost world, now you have all the incentive in the world to move stake around, to activate high performing nodes, to chase fees, to, um, you know, act in your own self-interest and the interest of the, the network at large. Um, so it's great to see such an increase. I'm sure some of this was due to kind of that pent up uh, demand and initial action when this became available. I wouldn't expect um, sort of that pace to necessarily maintain in some respects, though I'd imagine if you compare like a, a May this month to let's say a couple months from now, I think now because staking becomes cost effective um, for all different magnitudes of operators there's a lot of product work that the community and team is working on to actually encourage more stake movement um, doing things like showcasing to the community like which nodes earn the best yield in terms of the combination of fees and lpt rewards or surfacing like new nodes that are high performing and are actually sharing outsized portions of the fees that they're earning um, relative to um, I know that you may be staked on and, and that would encourage people to move stake to activate and route more work to new nodes and make this a more global, um, reliable kind of decentralized network. Um, and so I think there's a lot of product opportunity now that, uh, you know, things are cost effective on Arbitrum again. Yeah, um, definitely really powerful that, you know, you can move stake around and, you know, stake it to, you know, the most effective nodes and kind of help with the security and the strength of the network in that way. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, the verification um, procedures, the fast verification procedure, as well as some of the off-chain dispute resolutions and how that will also help, you know, in the future tie in to, um, you know, root work to most effective nodes and kind of help identify some that may not be operating as effectively. Yeah, so um, in my peer, if you're gonna send your video out to be encoded by a random node on a anonymous <laughs> network, then you kind of want some assurances that they're actually sending you back, you know, the, the correct encodings of the video. They're not sending you blank video or malicious video or, or something. And so in the initial live peer white paper and first version of the protocol, there was this um, verification game and algorithm um, that was leveraged called TrueBit, which could actually um, give you with, with perfect confidence on a deterministic computation that uh, it was ultimately done correctly with uh, uh, enough economic security. And that was great for the first version, the proof of concept, but it kind of only works for these deterministic computations that are done by CPUs. And a lot of the transcoding on the live peer network has evolved to be done by something called a GPU or a graphical processing unit. And that's actually, it's not deterministic, meaning that um, the same video may be encoded um, slightly differently um, each time, depending on a, a number of conditions and the hardware used. And so you actually need new verification algorithms. And the, um, you know, this is a open research area, at, you know, varying levels of completion, but the, the approach is called fast plus full verification. And the idea is that um, as a broadcaster, someone using this network, you can, uh, sorry, I'm getting a uh, 
apply the phone call here. Um, as a broadcaster, you can uh, very quickly check the results that come back to you from nodes on the network, and you can get a high confidence that this is you know, likely to be correct. Um, if you have that confidence, you can uh, you know use that use that video um, and send it to your users. And if for some reason you don't have that confidence, you can actually kind of quickly fall back to have another node on the network do the work or multiple networks do the work and compare it and, and again, get that um, high probabilistic guarantee. And then it needs to be coupled with a full verification process, which is more expensive, it's slower, um, but it can give you that sort of, um, you know, ultimate guarantee that the work that you thought was done incorrectly was, and that's the thing where you can apply like an on-chain economic penalty mm -hmm. to, you can slash a node stake and the stake that they have is kind of what secures their work. No one wants to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars by, you know, maliciously missing coding your video for most use cases. Um, and so where this is at right now, you can follow along with the research in our, our research channel, the fast verification, um, it has been live in various pilots on the network. Uh, there's an upcoming release which rolls it out more broadly. Um, full verification. Um, there's a lot of research on different approaches um, that are going on to to layer that on. Um, and so uh, that's like a, a kind of high item on our the network team's roadmap in the coming quarter. Great. Thanks so much for for going into that. I think it'll be really interesting to see you know when all the pieces come together. Um, and I, I guess just touching on a couple other roadmap items, um, you mentioned um, in, in um, a blog post um, a couple months ago, I believe, you know, working on overall latency, uh, decreasing overall latency for the network um, and, you know, getting up to the same level um, as, you know, some of the, you know, Web2 competitors like Amazon or Google. Um, and, and I guess I was just wondering, you know, what how, what level of speed has to be reached um, in order to you know compete with these established players? And you know what will it take to get there? Um, I guess how you know how far off are we from you know getting that uh, level of low latency with Live Peer Network? Yeah, good question. Um, this is a kind of a complex one because there's so many different types of protocols for different use cases um, in the video space, right? And so your typical broadcast um, that people have become accustomed to for many years, the one-to-many streaming over the internet for large events, um, can have anywhere from like 10 to 30 seconds of latency and up. You know, if you're if you're watching the live stream of the Olympics or the Super Bowl or something, you're typically seeing that level of, of latency. And you know, the live peer network has always been competitive um, on that, typically targeting you know eight to twelve seconds for the um, conventional uh, kind of HLS ABR delivery. Um, now there's there's kind of low latency broadcast, which is emerging via new protocols like LLHLS that gets you kind of this two to four seconds of latency. And actually, this is kind of not a uh, you know released you know uh production uh feature it's still kind of a, an alpha or a beta but um onlinepeer.com you can actually you know click a box and get access to kind of a lower latency protocol that brings the broadcast down to um you know that that two to four seconds leveraging um some of the the software called uh live peer catalyst that resulted from a um actually small acquisition that the the live peer team did a last year of a, a video technology company called Mist Server, and so you know the software is enabling lower latencies. And then when you get to things like real time, like the you know this chat that we're having here, where um, you know there's there's only a couple hundred milliseconds latency for a real time uh, communication. That's kind of a different video stack, and that actually doesn't leverage transcoding. It makes use of kind of different um, capabilities of the network that I certainly think are you know in scope for the vision of live peer being the world's open video infrastructure, but um, kind of re require a different set of technology and, uh, you know, you're targeting different use cases and, and whatnot than what kind of the main focus of live peer has been today. Um, per perhaps uh, um, when, when looking at the uh, migration to, to Arbitrum and we see that it, it went well and uh, um, everything is fine, light latency is there. Uh, have you been thinking of um, actually stimulating the demand of, uh, from, from other developers uh, who uh, build applications on, on other chains uh, 
have you been thinking of uh, enabling that part of demand? Yeah, absolutely. Like that was one of the big themes that became clear um, in 2021, I think that, hey, this truly is a, a multi-chain world, if you will. Um, there's no way that you can build a, a social app or a gaming app or, you know, something more consumer friendly on Ethereum where you're competing for gas block space with DeFi transactions that are willing to pay $1,000 for a transaction while no one's willing to pay $1,000 to like a tweet, for example. And so, um, you know, a lot of applications are being built on Polygon, on Solana, on some of the kind of emergent uh, Challenger L1s, if you will, Avalanche, et cetera. And um, the good news is like live peer as a video infrastructure doesn't require the the broadcaster, if you will, to be on on chain. And so they don't have to be on Ethereum or Arbitrum in order to use live peer. It's still still accessible to them, especially through a gateway like livepeer.com. Um, but what we've actually started doing is developing SDKs, um, software development kits for developers on these other chains. And um, the first one that kind of people can access is a Polygon SDK for um, minting video NFTs, leveraging the live peer to network to do that. And um, that's been really well received at hackathons. A lot of the hackathon projects have built on it. Um, and I think you'll probably see that sort of approach for, for other chains as well, as well as thinking how to actually be a little more native to those chains where they maybe don't need to go through a gateway. They can deposit their own native um, asset to pay for the infrastructure and, uh, and build directly. Yeah, so speaking of uh, SDKs and, and hackathons, so this is essentially enabling a better life for, for developers to be able to build on, on top of uh, LivePeer. Uh, could you perhaps tell us what are your um, favorite projects that you might have seen uh, during the past uh, hackathons uh, yeah, taking off on, uh, uh, on, on LivePeer? Sure, yeah. Uh, a couple come to mind. One is called Huddle01. They've, um, they've participated in a number of hackathons and continue to iterate and, uh, and I think are um, in a really well-positioned spot to actually be the sort of the Zoom of Web3. Um, if you will, you can use them for conferencing and then you can stream those events or those conferences using live peer to a broader audience. You can record the content, play it back later. And I think there's a great opportunity for communities to use it to actually organize their archive of content in a, in a web three native way. Um, so check out huddle one. Um, I would look at, um, an app that's been building on the lens protocol called, um, Iris. And I think they have another app called Tempra. Um, think of this as kind of experimenting in Web3 social and creating a feed, something that looks like a little bit like Twitter, but can embed video and other types of content. Um, so I think that's exciting. Um, there's an app called Beam, which is, um, think of it a little bit like a Patreon for creators publishing and, and streaming and creating and pushing out their content. Um, so yeah, I think these are, these are a few exciting ones that, that come to mind and we, um, you know, we've been hosting a series of Twitter spaces, I think typically on, on Friday uh, afternoons. So if you follow the live peer Twitter account, um, each week we try and you know showcase some applications building on live peer um, in Twitter spaces. Nice. I think we lost Mihai. Hopefully he'll be back in a second. I think he lost connection. Um, but I'll, I'll take over for now. Um, curious to know, you know, are there any other applications uh, being built leveraging live peer that can be like a you know decentralized alternative to Crowdcast, and then we can you know start you know hosting these kind of talks you know using Live Peer. Um, I think as you know um, Ryan mentioned on the last community call or last call with you, you know eating our own dog food so to speak, and you know getting to leverage you know Web three protocols instead of you know traditional Web two ones. Yeah, I'd encourage you to check out Huddle O One for that. I think um, okay. I think it can do the job because we could be having a conversation just like this amongst ourselves, but you can also be streaming it to a a broader right. audience. That's when um, you kind of need to leverage those different technologies to have that have that wide reach. Um, and I know we've used it for a number of internal meetings. Um, it's gotten better and better every single week. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we should be in a world where all of us are just archiving all of our content to YouTube <laughs> um, and hosting all of our calls through through Zoom necessarily. I think we should be uh, using the kind of open source, openly accessible web three native tools that'll build in the web three features that, you know, kind of mesh with the, the way that we're using this new new wave of the internet. 
We'll definitely check that out. Um, yeah, looking forward to that as well. Like seeing, you know, more Web3 things take over in all the things that we do um, in this industry. Um, and then I guess, you know, talking about, you know, other things that, you know, Live Peer um, can do moving forward or different services that the network can offer. Um, this upcoming quarter, you know, you're, you're planning to have object recognition and scene classification, you know, hit the scene. Um, and, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about like some of the powerful use cases that can open and also how it will affect the network, like how things will change, um, adding additional services of it, above and beyond video transcoding. Yeah, so these are, um, I'll elaborate on what these are. They're, they're interesting because they're other forms of compute that you want to do on video when you have this live stream flowing through. Transcoding is one type of compute that you want to use to transform the video, but you also might want to apply these machine learning algorithms to do things like detect um, what type of video is, is it? Is it likely to be violent content or adult content or copyrighted content? Because, you know, for your application, you may need to flag that or filter that out or, um, you know, take whatever actions are appropriate. Um, and that's, you know, it's very expensive to do that and, uh, you know, to leverage proprietary services at $9 an hour to do that detection and mesh that in with humans and stuff is, is challenging. But the Live Peer Network's really well suited to do it because we have these tens of thousands of GPUs that are already encoding the video and can do these computations at the same time. And so, um, you know, th these are things that kind of been communicated and on the roadmap for a long time. They're available in kind of pilot form, like we're working with design partners um, who are leveraging them in their applications, um, learning from that. I don't have a date for when they're like, productized and uh, kind of accessible to all because what we're learning kind of informs how you productize it. Mm -hmm. um, something like that kind of scene classification is this adult content is um, a little bit more straightforward. You can see how everyone can leverage that and uh, you know our node operators will be able to kind of earn more money for, for providing those services while transcoding. Something like object detection really depends on what type of object are you trying to detect? Um, do you train a model for that specifically for a specific use case? So for example, I thought it would be really cool if our network could automatically identify what PFP NFT was being shown wow. on the screen. And, <laughs> and if it could automatically identify that, it could let you hover over it during a video to see what NFT it is, like what the, how much it last sold for, what collection it's part of, who the owner is. And you could see how, you know, Web3 communities using a tool like Crowdcast where they're using those profile pics of their avatar would really leverage that. Um, but to do that, you have to like train a model for on all the NFTs and like productize it in that way. And is that useful? Is there a market? Um, this is all open source software <laughs> and an open project. I'd love to see someone like dive in and take that on. But that looks a little different than doing object recognition for say like an e-commerce shopping application where you want to identify what products people are holding up and make them clickable so they can link through to, to buy the products and, and those sorts of things. So um, those things we work with users on one-off use cases and um, try and try and determine what they need and then you know we can productize from there. Are you perhaps uh, thinking of uh, object recognition and scene classification? So pretty much the machine learning type of uh, applications to also be monetized in, in the future. So currently, if we're looking in terms of, uh, you know, purely transcoding, there, there's like transcoding fees. Um, are, are you thinking of uh, having a business model be behind uh, these, let's say, new features and these new use cases? Yeah, it's a, it's a business model for the network, right? So the um, kind of the abstraction of the live peer network is that nodes can advertise what service they're offering and how much they're charging for that service and then how they want to verify um, the work was performed correctly. And so right now, kind of the, the, the two services you can advertise are, are GPU transcoding and CPU transcoding, right? They're both, mm -hmm. they're both transcoding, it's like one. But you can imagine nodes could advertise the capability of you know, transcoding and scene classification and content detection. Um, and even expand to some of the things we talked about before, like um, firewall traversal for real-time conversations, like you know, with, with this stack or um, origin services where we're host and serve your video out to your users or to, to your CDN so that you don't have to. And uh, you know, this becomes a marketplace where node operators, depending on how much bandwidth they have or what type of hardware they have for transcode, can actually like 
offer a menu of services and then the users can take advantage of the yeah you know, the services they need at the most cost effective and reliable rates and that's how it kind of expands the the market um that's addressable for the live peer network um over time as well and then of course you know businesses can build products and services around the super powerful open network to you know productize even further in a way that makes it easily accessible to the users yeah that uh, that makes total total sense uh which brings us also to to the end of uh, our our questions uh Doug. and uh is there anything else you would like to to leave the audience and the live peer community uh with uh, for for the next quarter or like something exciting that is uh, that is in the pipeline for you guys well I, i'm really excited about live here and everything that we have coming up as you can tell one thing we didn't uh even mention today which is crazy is all the turmoil and mayhem that's gone on <laughs> in the broader um kind of cryptocurrency ecosystem um you know i shared a note to our community about this and, and we share here um you know one of the nice things about live here is that we've been around for a long time we've built through many cycles like this it almost feels normal and conventional and we have such like substance to fall back to where we power this very relatable use case video streaming for a huge market that's only only growing and so you know we're not this crypto speculative financial primitive that you know where there might be some negativity around those use cases for the next months or year or what not um you know we're we're excited about video you can tell we're pretty deep into video technology and we'll keep building through these cycles we're well capitalized to do so um and you know, we think we can be a big part of video for the next wave of the internet. So that's what I'm excited about. That's what keeps us and our team, uh, you know, energized during these tough times for all. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll all come out the other side even stronger than before, I'm sure. Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> infrastructure is definitely uh, here to stay. It, it, it solves like a, a real world problem, uh, right? Uh, a video transcoding. So there's something that there is a need for and the service provides definitely a value added to uh, to the users and uh, uh, this is also what uh, excites uh, Steph and myself to uh, to work on and to to cover uh, web3 infrastructure uh, protocols uh, all right yeah we'd like to uh, thank you a lot for for this fantastic conversation uh, we enjoyed it a lot and uh, uh, we thought that the answers were right yeah spot on and uh, uh, with that, uh, we'd like to uh, yeah, thank to, to the audience and to the, to the community. Uh, we'd like to leave you with uh, yeah, masari.io slash research. This is where we publish all our uh, research. So we do besides uh, yeah, um, quarterly reports, we have initiation of coverage. We, uh, we also have ecosystem overviews and everything you find, you find over there. Uh, also, we are very active in uh, uh, Twitter at uh, uh, Masari Crypto, and uh, we do have um, a newsletter that is uh, read by uh, very many people. So in case you'd like to uh, sign up for, the, for that newsletter, you pretty much get an, an article and many links uh, sent to you uh, every, every day. Uh, all right, uh, with that, um, thanks a lot and uh, yeah, have a great rest of the day and uh, uh, hopefully uh, a non-eventful uh, weekend ahead. <laughs> great. Thanks, right, Doug. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Stephanie. Thank Take you. Care. Bye, everyone. Nice to talk to you. Bye, everyone.